Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you to uh, another one of our uh, special live streams. And uh, today is even more special because we have a, a guest that I would love for all of you uh, to become familiar with and to get to know her and her amazing ministry among Muslims and uh, the wealth of information and knowledge that she will be sharing with us, not to mention, of course, uh, hopefully during the show, we will uh, point you to uh, the website and other things that she uh, is connected with, or at least a, a number of her work uh, from the past. She has a lot of videos that are available for people to also go and watch. And uh, our prayer is that she will become a regular speaker and a teacher on our channel. With us here, of course, is our dear sister, Dr. Cynthia, uh, who is a retired by the way, physician uh, with decades of experience ministering to our Muslim friends. And Dr. Cynthia is active in outreach, personal evangelism, discipleship, apologetics, writing, speaking, training, and uh, basically, and online activities. And she has hosted two television series that has been, uh, she has been basically a guest on a variety also of media outlets just like ours. And we'll ask her uh, right now about those TV uh, shows that she hosted. Uh, Dr. Cynthia also hosts uh, something called um, uh, ChristianFromMuslim.com, ChristianFromMuslim.com. And we will uh, post this link for you uh, on the chat box uh, during the show. And she also hosts a YouTube channel for Muslim evangelism and discipleship. Uh, with uh, multiple free video lessons and study guides. And um, another thing about uh, Dr. Cynthia is that uh, the American ethnic ministries uh, that Dr. Cynthia directs brings the gospel in word and deed to America's unreached. And it pioneered the path of the prophets, which is used on four continents. And we will ask her about this. And the methods, uh, booklets, bracelets, bilingual uh, dramas, put the gospel in a biblical context uh, that Muslims will understand. Uh, Dr. Cynthia also wrote a well-reviewed book exposing the Quran among awards uh, that she has received are the excellence in teaching from a major American university and a community physician of the year award, a former Muslim and best-selling author, uh, the late Nabil Qureshi said of her the following, Cynthia is one of the most effective evangelists to Muslims I have ever met. And that's our prayer that all of you will find her to be this way. And coming from our brother, uh, late brother Nabil, it means a lot. So Dr. Cynthia, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be with us here and to agree really to come to our show. We are honored to have you and our prayer is that uh, many uh, here will be blessed by uh, your knowledge and what you are going to share with us. So why don't you add if there is anything else that you feel is worth mentioning about your background, your ministry, your focus, and some of these uh, references to TV shows and other writings. Sure. Well, first, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. There's always so much for us to talk about when it comes to bringing the gospel to people that come from cultures different than those that Americans know. So I'm happy to share some of what I've learned with you. Some things, of course, I learned from others as I was training and other things I discovered through accident or research or experience, and I'm happy to bring that to you now. So yes, we've been working in all different kinds of ways because that's so important, especially now we're in a time of transition where it's not just in person. For a long time, we were mostly meeting in person and now we're doing so much over the internet as well. So it's sort of like Jesus said about someone who knows the old scriptures and learns the new. There are treasures we're pulling out that are silver and also gold. As we look at the traditional ways that people have worked with Muslims, the ways we can now do it in the West before they stop us, and what we can do online or over the internet. 
That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, of course, if uh, everyone is tuning in right now, and I want to thank uh, all of you who are watching live and uh, those who will join us in a little bit, uh, you will be uh, really up for a, a blessed treat for all of you. And thank you for the moderators as well. Uh, we are uh, hosting Dr. Cynthia, and uh, the title that we have chosen for this particular episode, uh, I added basically the phrase street apologetics intentionally, because I know that will grab many people's attention about how to do a quick evangelism and a quick apologetics responses to some of the tough questions. And that's what we called it, short answered to hard questions or tough questions. And I know many of us encounter, in this case, Muslims, and oftentimes we feel like we have to really have a degree to understand Islam. We have to go to seminary to understand how we respond to their objections. And we need to watch a lot of videos and we need to attend many conferences. When in fact, you know, uh, sometimes it could be a simple way to correspond to these hard questions that keep the dialogue going. And this is why, Dr. Cynthia, we would love for you to tell us a little bit about why did you call this particular approach uh, short answers to hard questions. That's what we want to do today. So if you could maybe put up uh, a slide or maybe our second slide, we just have a couple of these okay. here for uh, to help our viewers at home. Can they see that now? Yes, I will bring it yeah. right now. I'm not sure if they can see it, but now they will be able to see it. Right. What I want to put this in context of is what I call the job description for Christians. And if you look on the screen, you see build, share, and challenge. And it came to me a number of years ago that everything that a Christian does with a Muslim, in fact, everything that a Christian does with anyone can fall into one of these three categories. The first is build bridges. And that's the way you connect with someone. There, where you are and who you're connecting with would make a difference, but that is a very important thing to do. Even if you're just challenging someone, there needs to be some kind of a connection, a bridge. If mm -hmm. you want to say, well, what do you mean you could do it with anybody? Well, maybe the person you're working with, how do you, how do you connect to them? How do you build a bridge to them? How do you build a bridge to a, a relative that you haven't seen in a while or even your children? So we're always in our life building bridges or sharing truth. Our ultimate truth to share is Christ. And we need to build a bridge even from that person to Christ. That's our second kind of bridge. But our goal is that everyone should know Christ and know that they are loved and there is a special purpose for them and that they can have hope. So that's our most important of the three. But if we don't build a bridge to these people, we won't be able to share anything with them. The third most important factor, can you remember it now, guys? What, what is it? Build bridges, share Christ, challenge, falsehood. In this case, it's going to be challenge Islam. And one of the great people who trained me was called Brother Elijah. He was out of Palestine and about oh, getting near 20 years ago. Now, he told me, Cynthia, Islam is so entrapping and it's such a stronghold that people will not even try to get out, even if they think that Christianity is true, even if they know it, they need to know that Islam is false. So sooner or later, we need to get around to challenging it. And that's part of what we're going to be doing here is what we call apologetics and polemics. So let me repeat these three before we go on a little more to what we're our topic today is, but please remember as a Christian working with Muslims, I will always be building a bridge, sharing truth, hopefully Christ, and challenging falsehood. If you keep that in mind, it's like you know what you're doing every time you're with a Muslim. Sometimes you're just building bridges. 
And maybe we'll talk about how to do that someday, but you, you don't need to feel like, oh, I have to do it all at one time. No, trust the Holy Spirit, pray, trust the Spirit, and you will go through these things. Sometimes you will simply be challenging, but that would be in a certain settings. So we'll talk about some of those today here too. So remember, build a sure challenge. Okay, let's talk about how we are going to do some of this when it comes to defending the faith and challenging Islam. Next slide, please. We Very have good. something called a swap. And what al was teasing you with in the title today was about street work because we call swap streetwise apologetics and polemics because friends, a lot of us love to learn about apologetics and polemics. Now apologetics is basically defending the faith. The way I like to see it when we're working with other religions is that we are abolishing the stumbling blocks that keep people from coming to Christ because there are things that they don't understand about our faith or don't like. And we need to get rid of those to make it easy for them to get the gospel. So that's our apologetics. Polemics is not our main focus today, but that is where we are challenging them and um, their beliefs and pointing out that they're not correct. So streetwise apologetics and polemics, what does that mean? Look at the first dot up there. If you see that, this might start to make sense. And I think there probably are a lot of your viewers, Al Fadi, who have done this. There are many apologetics conferences, there are great books, and now there's an abundance of material on YouTube from many very good presenters. So it's almost like the way I felt my first year in medical school. I felt like I'm standing under Niagara Falls and all of this, you know, water's coming at me, all of this medical information that there's no way you can totally absorb and process. So a lot of people might be getting that. And yet the people they're hearing it from are professionals like Al Fadi, like a number of our brothers and sisters, I won't mention their names, but that are presenting. And if you have been to a debate, our brothers and sisters online, if you have, do you remember that for an opening statement, there is usually about 20 minutes. So the presenter has a time to present a nice, organized, well-developed, multi-step argument. And that's that's because they have a platform. But that, you know how much percentage of Christians who want to share the gospel or use apologetics and polemics that is? <laughs> Minuscule. Mostly they're people like me and others that I uh, want to do it, but nobody's going to listen to us that long. Did you make yeah. one comment? Well, well, I want to just ask you, why do you think is that? In fact, uh, the number one attack I get from Christians, and yes, let me repeat again, the number one attack I get from Christians, me or Sam Shimon or any of the apologists, is that Christians don't like the approach of apologetics. Somehow they feel like it hurts feelings. Tell me why, please. There are a couple of reasons. One is American culture, we avoid conflict. And as you know, other cultures don't have that. They don't have that problem. So uh, I had a few Arabs staying with me a number of years ago who were best friends. I thought they were arguing upstairs all the time, you know, <laughs> almost sounded like knives out, but that was just their style and they, they were best friends. So different cultures look at it differently. And yeah, we may have a lack of confidence, but what I'm trying to assist people to do today is to have more confidence because it's better to know three things that you use than to know a huge amount that you don't use. And I really do believe that, you know, Matthew 10, when you're on the spot, God will give you the words. Yes, we have what we call due diligence. Let's learn as much as we can. And there's a huge 
need in the church today for us to do more apologetics because we're hemorrhaging our young people. That's one of the two major needs in America. One is to keep uh, keep the people in the church by better apologetics and also bring others in. So what uh, my point was with when we speak, instead of like, I mean, most people are watching videos 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour, or they're going to a two hour debate. They will never in their life get that much time to present. So out of that frustration, I've come to realize we need to realistically help people use what they know. And that is talking about the short answers that we're wanting to do today, because you may want to explain all this and you may have written a paper on it. But when you're having lunch with your friend or you've just met a Muslim at an international party, nobody's going to listen to it. So how do we how do we make it work? That's what we're talking about, making every word count like 50. So I want to give you some clues about how you can do that. Yeah, please do. Please do. And let me know whenever you want me to change the slide. Well, sure. Go to the next one. So that's what streetwise apologetics and polemics is about. And actually, I guess before we leave this slide, the, the idea of the street is important. I Some of the online apologetics I do relate to things that are said and done at Speaker's Corner in London, which I think many of your viewers know about. And people sometimes get upset. Why are the Christians doing this? Why are they doing that? And that is because they don't understand the setting of Speaker's Corner. I have spoken there a number of times too. So I know what, what it's like, what the genre. So there's the debate genre where you get dedicated time, people will listen to you. There's the street genre that is speaker's corner where you know you're going to get heckled. There's what you could call a street genre, which is what I do almost every day, just meeting Muslims around town or whatever, where you can talk to them a little bit and they will listen. And then there's a, a setting, by, by genre I'm meaning a setting. There's a setting where you're one-on-one -on -one with your friends or with Muslims that you are what I might call pre-discipling, you're being friends with them, gradually teaching them about the Bible. So that setting is really important. And when we go on through that, knowing that settings are different, people are also different. And I guess we can go to the next slide. Our example for that is Jesus, because he gave people different answers depending on who they were and what they were like. Do you remember, Al-Fadi, how, or do you see a difference in the style of Jesus, say, for example, the way he talked to his disciples or the women at the well or a widow and the way he spoke to the Pharisees? Absolutely, of course. I mean, uh... Just you go to John 3 and you'll see how he spoke with Nicodemus and you'll go to John 4 and how he spoke with the Samaritan woman. And then uh, John 5 or John 6 or John 7, how he is basically exposing the Pharisees. And uh, so th there are different styles. And in Matthew, I love chapter 23 where Jesus used the seven woes, seven curses. Mm -hmm. Now, people get shocked, you know, basically that, that Jesus doesn't have the love of Christ in him by cursing people. You know, that's amazing to me, technically. You mean sometimes they, they say that they're very troubled by it. Well, they don't know that even Jesus used that uh, yeah. approach with the people who deserve to hear it, you know. And he wasn't using it with everybody. He was specifically using it to a certain group. Exactly. The way I use it in my personal approach mostly is if I'm meeting or in a relationship with someone that I don't think has gotten to the point where I've definitely got to challenge them. But I go by the way they are coming to me. And there's a, a famous play called Henry V by Shakespeare, where the King Henry, he's talking about his men. They've had a hard battle. And he says, 
As we are, we would not seek a fight. But as we are, we will not shun one. And so that's the way I look. You know what? I'm meeting Muslims, say, on campus in a mosque or whatever. I'm not looking for a fight. But if they're going to come and start talking like a Pharisee, then, you know, if they tell me the Bible is corrupted, well, then I'm going to have to say something that they might not like in return. So we we do play by the setting, by the person, and by what they say to us and how we respond. And I think that is a way we can move forward in a good way. So we have those examples of, of Jesus. Then we also have some style examples of some actual examples in the Bible of what they told us to do. Remember Peter and Paul? Paul told us, of course, to speak the truth with gentleness and respect in Ephesians. And then in 2 Timothy 2, he says to teach with great patience. So we need to, as much as possible, teach with great patience. And that's what I want you to see about the technique train here. If, as an analogy, you could think of bringing the gospel to someone as a train, a gospel train. I think there's a kid's song about that, that you're bringing the gospel. And as you think of it, there are some analogies that are similar to the train that work with the per the person. And this first one up here, sit tight, earn the right. Uh, that partly goes with the fact that we need to be listeners and we're going to hear stuff we don't like. And if you've, if you've been on an old train rail, some of you know, it kind of bumps like this and you do have to hold on. It's not always easy. And I find it's difficult for our people to be patient when they are hearing these things. And I don't know about you, Al Fadi, but almost every day when I'm online working, I'm seeing Christians just shooting off their mouth in ways that are unnecessarily offensive. And I get it because it's so frustrating. When you hear lies, outright lies, when you hear Bible verses taken out of context, when you hear principles twisted, when you hear blasphemy of things that you hold precious, it's really hard. And so you can understand why Paul was telling Timothy, teach with great patience, because it's difficult. So I have a good story about that. The brother Elijah I was talking about from Palestine, when he first came to America and we were going to mosques and all kinds of Muslim meetings and events and seminars, he really could almost not sit tight. He'd be like jumping up, going to the back and walking around and he would say, Cynthia, for 1,400 years, we couldn't say anything. It drives us crazy. Now I want to say something. So I don't know if that experience happened to you ever, Al-Fadi, Al but it, it is. It I want to be yeah, aware it all of us. frustrating. It does. It does. It, it does happen to all of us for sure. So sit tight and earn the right, you know, be respectful, listen to what people have to say. And... Then as far as hang loose, you're the caboose, that means listen. I'm happy to listen to someone for an hour, talk about Islam, what they believe, whatever, if I get five minutes to share the gospel at the end. So don't expect to have 50-50. I think if you, if you get at least an opportunity, that will be a great thing. And I think, you know, uh, Dr. Cynthia, not only listen, and of course, I mean, you do this all the time, but I'm talking to our viewers here, hopefully who will benefit from this. Not only it's about listening, it's about being a good listener. You know, uh, sometimes we let our own presuppositions get in the way. In other words, you hear a word from the Muslim person in this case, and instead of listening to what the Muslim is saying, you begin to think, okay, that now that, that, that word was wrong, I'm going to respond to it. And you start being consumed by that and and all of a sudden you start getting into a tug war a debate and 
if we let the Muslim just flesh out their own theology, and by the way, listen, he, they don't know the biblical theology. They have no clue what the Bible teaches. So, of course, I expect him to say things that don't make sense. Of course, I expect him to say things that they assume are true. Of course, I expect him to maybe even attack my theology, even in a kind way sometimes. But let them say it. That opens the door for a dialogue, for a discussion. Let's jump on that opportunity. Well, um, thank you. You brought it up. Excellent point. You know, I see where you're coming from. May I, you know, share with you about this or that? If we can do it this way, I think, first, the Muslim will feel respected. Second of all, you're correcting their theology and their misunderstandings. Right. Right. I, so you're saying listen with interest and learn. I tell our students, you are a learner. I'm officially appointing you as a student of Islam and culture and Arabic and all of that and learn. And even sometimes you've heard things many times, you still hear a different twist and you know how someone is thinking by listening to each person. So we need to pray for grace to not only be patient, but also to listen and to learn about them and their, and their point of view. And of course, then we can ask questions, which is really helpful. That helps us understand more of what they're saying. And sometimes it helps them think through their own not so sound ideas. Exactly. I'm all yeah. about reasoning with them and let them hear what they're saying sometimes. Because once you ask the right questions, they begin to hear their own argument. And that should prompt them to either, you know, slow down what they're saying or maybe even ask. You know, the Bible tells us be quick to listen, slow to respond, slow to anger. You know, so notice the connection between right. responding and being angry. Right. We, yeah. we don't want to be angry. We want to, like uh, Peter said, always be ready to answer, but with gentleness and respect. And part of why I'm glad you're letting me be on your program today is to just remind people of these things. I see a lot of apologetics and a lot of people enjoying it, but not a lot of people knowing how to do it how to speak the truth in love, how to be patient, how to use gentleness and respect. And I know it can be done because by God's grace, I've been able to do it at times. In fact, one of our board members who's now go on, who has gone on to heaven, I used to say, Joanna could tell you you were going to hell and you'd thank her for it because she was so nice about it. And so I know if you, if you are filled with love for people, then what you say means more. And there are some cliches like they don't care what you say till they know that you care. And I know sometimes it's really hard when either people have attacked the gospel or been blasphemous or, you know, what I'm seeing online now, you two Al-Fadi people supporting the Taliban and you're like, I just, you know, I just want to, but we can't, we have to, have to crank it down and try to, Remember, that's a human being that God loves and speak to them that way and correct them like Paul told Timothy to correct their errors in in love. Amen. So that's what hang loose. You're the caboose means, you know, await your turn and be patient. Now, less is more. This is something that how many of our viewers raise your hand out there? Have you heard this? I think anyone who's studied any communications or writing has learned less is more. And yet that's also something I find that Christians are having a problem doing, even Muslims too. You know, when they're answering something, you'll when we get huge long answers that no one's going to read on either side, there's no point for that. So there is a saying of short, sharp, shock. You know, if you can make your answer short, which is what we're trying to give people the concept of today, short and sharp, that is more powerful than a 20 page dissertation. So we really want to keep it that way. And I remember you probably know, I'm sure you've met many times Al Fadi with Father Zachariah, Abuna Zachariah. 
Boutros. I yeah. did meet with him, yes. I'm sure you've met him. So uh, a couple of decades ago, maybe 15, 18 years ago, when I met with him, he was asking me to work with him. But this was something he said was about short, sharp shock. The other thing he said that uh, really helped me with this apologetics and polemics thing, because I knew he had said a lot of things that had offended a lot of people. But he told me, Cynthia, the way I talk to a Muslim in person, one-on-one, -on -one, that I know, is very different than the way I talk from a platform on television or something like that. So I'd also like our people to know that, that yeah, you may see people say things in a sassy way on the internet or on YouTube, something like that. But when you are with a person, or even if it's just someone that you've met online, try to visualize them as a person and try not to act like you have a large platform where you can just say anything and it's not going to hurt an individual person's feelings. So less is more. Number amen. four, I, go ahead, make a comment. No, I was saying amen, and uh, I, I agree with you. And and I want to just add that David Wood himself one time says, you know, people think that just because David does videos in certain style, that means that's his approach to evangelize people. In fact, one time somebody rebuked him and says, I wish you would do what the other Christian did to bring Nabil Qureshi to Christ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's an interesting story, you know, and uh, he showed me even the interactions and that, and it's like, okay, well, I, I guess uh, uh, when he does something on screen doesn't necessarily mean that that's his style when he's one-on-one -on -one with a person. Exactly. And we all like this. We all have our styles, yeah. Exactly. And another thing that can be softer is especially – if I'm working with Muslim women, and I think, you know, two of the Saudi women, actually, I did this with two Saudis that, that you know, Al-Fadi. When I finally found the, um, the Shia documents that exposed women's rights in Islam, it, it was in Shia. It was so bad. I did not want to tell them in person. I did not want to shoot the piano player. <laughs> so, uh, because I want to have a loving approach. So I just put pink tags on all of those and gave the book to them. And wow, after that, it made a huge change because they were reading it from someone they respected. These were the sayings of Ali. Um, you can laugh at my pronunciation, but Nahjubulaga, you know that one. Yeah, Nahjul <laughs> Balaga, exactly. Yeah. It's one of the main sources that they claim, of course, it's uh, coming from Ali, the first imam out of the 12 imams, obviously, depending on that uh, doctrine or theology that they follow. And yes, it's as good as the Quran, by the way. So there were very harsh things in there. And it's a softer way sometimes to let someone read it themselves. And that there's the power of that. Because they had been telling me, oh, all that Sunni stuff is terrible. If you read what Ali said, if you read what Ali said. Now it was hard, and those days it was hard to find in English. So I finally did. But anyway, let's go to number four, practical, not theological. And there are probably some people out there that really won't like me for this. But I have a saying, which is the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And we'll come back to that. It's not original with me, but it's so important. If when you're talking with Muslims, there are some great theological stumbling blocks. Yes, but there are some things that you really shouldn't try to explain in a deep theological way unless it starts coming up. But I do see people going down rabbit holes that are very confusing for someone who's not trained in Christian theology, hermeneutics, all of these kinds of things. So try to use it very practical. And we'll talk about a couple of those examples. So let's go on to number five, which is what I call turnaround. Okay. Next slide. There we go. Turnaround is where 
something is presented to you as an accusation or a problem and you find or you know of a way to turn it into something positive. And I like to, to point out that as Christians, we don't have anything to be ashamed of, okay? Don't be nervous if we're getting attacks on the Bible or ashamed because we should be confident because we're coming from a point of strength. Because we're coming from a point of strength and because Islam has so many weaknesses, we again can be gentle. And for example, in Philippians, Paul tells us to, um, what am I thinking? Be in no way afraid of what they're saying. Say Philippians 1.28, because we, we have that confidence before Christ. And I want to give you an example of why or I learned that turnaround can be good. I know Al Fadi will know this story and many of his viewers, but you know in Quran uh, 33, around 37, it tells this remarkable story of how the prophet of Allah, Muhammad, sort of accidentally saw his daughter-in-law in an undressed state and was attracted to her. So this is the story of Z and Z, Zayed, and you can correct my pronunciation, Zayed and Zaina, that uh, the stepson, or I mean the adopted son was married to this woman and supposedly Muhammad was so humble, even though he was in love, actually lusting after her, he didn't want to presume to take this, but so that it would be a sign for the believers that they didn't need to forbid themselves the wives of their adopted sons, Allah gave a special revelation. Because of this, we find Muhammad having another sexual exception to his prophethood that he gets these special things that even end up in the Quran. We find out that adoption, which is so important in so many countries, that's forbidden. And just even ugh, we get accusations from Muslims about uh about you know things in the Bible like David and Bathsheba. Well, we're not saying that's good, but in this particular case, it's a really bad story. You might not believe this, Al Fadi, but you might. That I was once in a university student, Muslim student circle, like a halakha, I think you call it, you know, like a Bible study circle, a Quran study. And the teacher from the mosque, a woman from the mosque was telling these young women, Allah is so wonderful. He is so good. He is so loving. He even told Muhammad that he could marry Zainab. And it, it wasn't, he, you know, he didn't want to, but in all his love and goodness, he cared that much about the prophet to do that. And I was like sitting in the, the side of the circle thinking, don't barf, Cynthia. It wouldn't really be appropriate. But for me, that's taking something really ugly and making it good. There's a Ben Franklin proverb that comes to mind. Maybe it shouldn't, but it says, fart proudly. I mean, it's like you're doing something really bad or the Isaiah verse, it says they parade their sin like Sodom. This is ugly, folks, but they turned it into something beautiful, even for the young women. So what I'm saying is we don't have anything to be ashamed of. If they come after you with an accusation, can you turn it around into something good? Now, I don't know. I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Al-Fadi. If you want to give an example of how you might do that or Maybe people can think right now of a, of an accusation they might have heard and how we can turn it around. Or you're talking about like something bad that um, Muhammad did? Is that what you're referring to? Okay, let me give you an example of an attack we get so that people will understand. 
Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll engage you in it together. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to, to uh, say guess what I'm thinking. So one of the accusations we get is, you're saying God became a man. You're saying that he would get dirty and dusty. He would be inside a woman. He would be born. He would go to the bathroom. What kind of God do you have? You think he would do that? You know, like, that's so terrible. So my short answer to that is what I call a turnaround. They're saying it's so terrible. We say, yes, isn't that wonderful? That's why God loves I mean, that's why Christians love Jesus so much. That's why we love God, why we're so thankful that he was willing to humble himself like that for us. So you yes. see the idea. There, yes, I mean, that's a great example. Exactly. Really bad. What? Yeah, that's a great example. I mean, uh, I like that you brought this up because that's common. Yes, Muslims bring yeah. this up most of the time. Most of the time we hear that. How could he? But, you know, if you just flip it around and bring their attention to the fact of, yeah, you're making a good point. It is really bad it, because we don't usually present it that way. I mean, yeah, we will sometimes hear it in church. God humbled himself, Philippians 2 and all of that. But after they have pointed out how bad it is, we can say, wow, now you see why Christians love him so much. And that helps make the point that we appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus and yep. the humility and all of it more. So we're using their way of thinking, but tweaking it. So I call that a turnaround. Yeah, I mean, I can I can think of a quick example also. Maybe it's close to what you're saying. I mean, I uh, anytime a Muslim, especially when they send me emails with uh, attacks and accusations and threats and cuss words and uh, all kind of labels, uh, my response usually is that I thank them for saying what they said because that even makes me love Christ more because he told me to expect all of that. And then I'll quote a couple of verses that Jesus says, the world will hate you. From In other words, I'm showing him that you just proved to me that Jesus is actually telling me the truth about what's going to happen to me. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. That's turning that accusation around, finding something good out of it. and. It gives it a positive approach without us feeling all cornered. Amen. So let's, Amen. Let's see if we can maybe get through the, I think we can get through these. I would say we'll get through it and maybe give an example or two in addition to this example so people can get a flavor of what you mean. And obviously, folks, uh, if you're just tuning in, this is uh, our first uh, you know, episode of many to come with Dr. Cynthia, and we titled this one, Short Answers to Hard Questions, or Short Answers to Tough Questions. And of course, we're talking about the, uh, the you know, the, the theme here is evangelism and apologetics with Muslims. And all of you, if you are involved in any type of ministry to Muslims, guaranteed, you've got a flavor of that, you know, how they push back, how they ask you a question, the, the, the point that we're trying to make here and uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Cynthia is trying to do is we shouldn't shy away from the engagement. We shouldn't uh, feel like, oh, I don't have the answer to this. We should always capitalize on the opportunity and find ways to keep that dialogue going, keep that discussion going. Otherwise, and I can tell you how Muslims think because I was one, if you don't answer anything, if you walk away from the conversation, if you change the topic, here is what I'm thinking. You don't have an answer for it. Therefore, my faith in Islam is solid. I am confident then that I'm following the truth because you could not answer my question. That's how it goes usually. And don't you find that Muslims like to talk about religion more than we do? A little exactly. long ago, you asked me about what is our reluctance. I said part of it is we don't want conflict, but part of it is like I was raised that there are certain topics you don't have in polite conversation because it will lead to trouble. And one of them was religion, of course, politics. So, but I say the good news is Muslims like to talk about religion. That gives you more opportunity. The bad news is Muslims like to talk about religion. That means they like to do most of the talking, but we want to be able to, when we can, 
to say those things that will really help them either bring down the stumbling block or leave them with a little bit of a question in their mind. Exactly. And and uh, leaving him with a little bit of a question in their mind is a very effective strategy. I can speak for myself. I know Brother Nasser one time mentioned it, that we go home when people are witnessing to us and we begin to think about what you told us. We don't want to reveal it to you in public because we feel like we're going to be felt ashamed that that you somehow you won the argument. We want to look like we are solid, you know, we're confident, but we go home and we start thinking about what you said. Or when in my case, the people are asking me to present an evidence when I say Jesus wasn't crucified. And they're like, I remember saying, oh, wow, I mean, that, that's a big claim. I mean, our entire faith is based on it. So what evidence do you have? And, and it's questions like this that cause me to go home and think about it. And I'm like, that is a good question. I mean, so am I to say only one verse in the Quran refuted this mountain of evidence that they just presented to me? So we need to help our Muslim friends, even if they didn't do it in front of you, to hmm. keep these thoughts going in their mind. Exactly and totally. This is what I hear from many, many former Muslims that they won't agree in person, but they think about it after. And so that's encouraging to us too, because many Christians who are new to doing this may also face the trial of discouragement. You know, besides all those other things we mentioned, it can be discouraging if you feel that you're not getting through to them. But some of this is going to take years and they start thinking of it, just like you said, Al-Fadi, when they're on their own or away from you. And that's what we what we hope to do. And we know it does happen. So uh, we're encouraged for the examples we get. Amen. Let me, uh, you want me to project the slide one more time to continue? Uh, yeah, you can. You did ask for another example of a turnaround, though. Yes, please. And, go ahead. And I'll give you that before we go on to the next one, which is predict and diffuse. Okay, so another turnaround we often get is, where's the Injil that Jesus wrote? You know, where's the New Testament? That, that which you call the New Testament, which you call the Injil, that's not it. That wasn't even written until decades after Jesus, you know. So I'm sure many of our brothers and sisters out there have heard this criticism, right? It's one of the things we defend all the time. Well, there is a short turnabout to that. And remember, all of these things we're calling swaps. They're the uh, streetwise apologetics and polemics techniques. All of these things are to just come about it, make everything change a bit. So this particular one, which is a turnaround, is to say, you know, the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus were so strong that the early church didn't even need the New Testament to start Christian churches for Christianity to begin. They just used the Old Testament and the predictions. It wasn't until the apostles and disciples got older and the message had spread farther away where there weren't apostles and disciples that it actually needed to be written down. So that's kind of a swap where they're saying it's really bad that Jesus didn't have it. And you're saying, what? Because they're actually saying the Old Testament is corrupt. Uh, also, you're saying, hey, it, it, it underscores the continuity of the Old and New Testament. And it's just a good and different way of thinking. So I call that a swap. Yeah, I, I mean, I, again, I like at least the, the, the reasoning that you're giving to them. That doesn't mean, and I want to clarify, that doesn't mean that Dr. Cynthia is saying she does not really acknowledge the New Testament, for instance, because I know some people, some people here, bless their heart, they can jump all over these kind of things. But uh, all that to say is we're teaching you techniques to just meet the Muslim at their level. Okay, so you say the Injil is corrupt. Fine, great. You know, you know what? The church and the early church did not uh, uh, really, uh, didn't get found uh, founded on, on the New Testament. It uh, wasn't founded, I should say, in the New Testament because the New Testament is still getting, getting written, but it's founded on the Old Testament where the New Testament is explaining it now and it's digging deeper into it and 
providing evidence that's been fulfilled and so on and so forth. Jesus was reasoning with the Jews using the Old Testament. When he was uh, on earth, the New Testament still wasn't written, but he was using the scripture. You know, that's the word of God. So that's an excellent point. Exactly. Yeah, I'm not I'm not saying anything against the New Testament. And that's wonderful. And of course, we do need our biblical apologetics. But these are just things to kind of like make them think, draw them up short. And I know there are Muslims watching this, so they'll come up with answers to them and we'll, we'll come up with different swaps. But yeah, that's the idea is to, to present something else. So uh, if we want to go on to the next one to predict and defuse, that is because uh, there are certain areas that those of us have been talking to Muslims know are going to be like landmines. They're either going to cause a big problem that maybe you're just in a, a social setting in an international gathering, or maybe you are uh, Maybe you just don't want to get sidetracked from what how you're presenting the gospel. So what, you, what we encourage you to do is to predict where there could be roadblocks, like say you're on a train track. You want to predict if there might be something on the track that would obstruct. Predict and get rid of it. So for those, I would say... Yeah, things like you want to avoid, usually you want to avoid talking about Isaac versus Ishmael in the beginning, and you want to avoid certain political discussions. But let's do let's do a predict and diffuse that deals with one of what we call the big four, which we probably don't have time to get fully into. But there are four things we know they're always going to be in a Muslim mind that they will have objections about. And one is the Trinity. Now, something we always hear is, where's the word Trinity in the Bible? Where does the Bible talk about Trinity? So if you are discussing religion with a Muslim, or if you're in a setting where that can come up, my point, what I try to do, and I'm not saying everybody has to do this, but I know this is possibly a theological rabbit hole situation where people start talking about which word is what word and trouble is. And what I say will even often before them, well, if we're talking about the character of God, I will say, well, Trinity is a theological term. It's not really in the Bible, but we use it to describe the complex way that we see God in these three aspects. So with that, I've predicted it. I've taken away their bomb. They want to be able to throw at me. <laughs> that's, not, that's not even in the Bible. And as I just say, it's not in the Bible. Again, I don't have anything to be fearful of. The fact that that exact term is not used in the Bible doesn't mean that it isn't true or that's not what the Bible presents or that I have to hide under a rock. Oh, I hope they don't ask that one. No, just accept it. It's a, it's a term that we use to describe it. And we can go on from there. So that's, uh, we can talk more about Trinity later. But if we want to finish those last couple of ones, did you... Um, did you have another question about this or predict and diffuse? Uh, no, we can we can keep going because I don't want to slow you down here. And uh, th this is, again, another exa great yeah. example. Right. Don't let them use it as a bomb. You know, defuse it. <laughs> then the next one we would say soft and sideways. And that's because I like to avoid head-on collisions. I like to come at something from a little different angle. And we, we do that a lot in our apologetics. So instead of just meeting head on, we like to come at it a little, a little different. And part of that, I probably should mention our Path of the Prophets gospel method, which I should have the tract here to show you, but it's not within reaching distance. We use the path of the prophets to explain the gospel because it uses the facts that Muslims know. So rather than go head on like I used to when I was first talking to Muslims with 
maybe John 3.16 or something like that, we come a little from the side and use what they know that is true, like the sacrifice of Abraham and the law of Moses to show little by little that there was a prophesied final sacrifice. And a lot of times by the time we get to that, having gone the sideways method, for example, there's one PhD Iranian I met on campus who by the time I went through this path, he said, so Jesus is the Lamb of God. You know, it clicked uh, how that came through. So that's a way that we try to go sideways and soft, not head on thinking. You've got to think like an American using our four spiritual laws, which is great. You know, I love that. But but use something a little different from the side. And if you are interested in that method, it is on our website www.christianfrommuslim.com. Go under resources. We also tell how you can use a bracelet to share that gospel truth. And that's, that's a wonderful lesson just on its own. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, I want to just uh, make sure, um, uh, Marianne, if you can put the website uh, here again, it's www.christianfrommuslim.com for everyone. That would be great. I already have, uh, uh, I, I actually, I have to admit, I, I tried to have the link on uh, Facebook and Facebook says they disagree with your approach. <laughs> so I'm going to have it in the YouTube channel. Uh, I was kind of like baffled by why they wouldn't allow me to, to have it in there. They wouldn't let me post yours today either. Yeah. yeah they so sent me for Facebook. They wouldn't let me post on Facebook. Uh, you know, Lord help us. But what we're trying to do with that, just for our viewers, because what I think is so important, probably the most important thing I'm doing now, is using that for free training for churches, Sunday schools, Christian colleges, interest group, missionaries before they go overseas. Go to our homepage. There's a two minute intro video and YouTube has basically all our videos too on Christian from Muslim. But the two minute intro will show you what it does. It will show you how you can get the lessons and those lessons will cover all the basics that you need to know either from one hour to a year's worth of training. And we have study guide It's already up to 500 pages with more coming. So each lesson has a study guide. So your Sunday school class can watch the video at home. You can discuss it online. Everybody has study questions. And so that's what we're hoping that will help people more and more so they can reach out to the Muslims in every community. We've got Afghans coming to us now. We've had so many Iraqis and Syrians and, and every church should have somebody at least who knows how to talk to them. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Cynthia. We appreciate, uh, you know, uh, your time and appreciate also the simple approach that you have just shared. Very uh, precise, very short and uh, engaging. And at the same time, it doesn't really require a whole lot of preparation. All you have to do is just know how to just keep the dialogue going. Now, let's say someone says, well, OK, I kept the dialogue going, but I still don't have the answer to their argument. That's fine. What you want to do is you want to continue just talking to them and you can always come back later and continue this next week, uh, throughout the week, throughout the month, you know, build a friendship with them uh, to that to keep that uh, going. But the point is make them look like you are interested in what they're saying. You're listening to what they're saying. You're not shutting them off, but at the same time, helping them correct some of their misunderstanding. Oh, so if, let's say they will tell you that, did you know? I mean, I, I got asked this question before. Did you know that Jesus wasn't crucified? I'm like, oh my goodness, wow. I I actually, that's not the case uh, in the Bible. I mean, uh, the Bible says he was crucified in uh, multiple ways. In fact, he was, the crucifixion was even predicted 700 years before his coming, you know? So, so I, I'm interested in your information. Where, where did you get that information from? Oftentimes, you'll see how quickly they will change the topic because he just heard it from somebody and he just shared it with you. And, and look how they say it. I mean, he, he wants you to believe that he cares for you. That's great. You know, like Dr. Cynthia said, they love to talk religion. And in their view, they want you to become a Muslim. Why? Okay, well, it's all about good deeds. 
It's all about the idea that they think like aside from Islam, you have no hope of heaven and things like that. You know, it's we shouldn't get offended by that. All we have to do now is, okay, well, let's talk about this. You know, let me show you my evidence why I believe he was crucified. Now, slowly and gradually, all you're doing is you're just correcting his misunderstanding or her misunderstanding. Now, unfortunately, in the West, we like to see results immediately, Dr. Cynthia. I want to see the person converted immediately in front of my eyes, you know. And if it takes three, you know, cups of coffee at Starbucks, then I'm a loser. I, I don't know how to do it, you know. <laughs> you know, ministry to Islam is not as simple as you might think. I, I would argue ministry to Mormons is the same. Ministry to Jehovah Witnesses is the same. So it's not just Islam. Well, that, final words. Uh, yes. I'll give you the final words, please. Yes, we need to, to love people. Well, uh, the last thing on our list of the techniques is illustrations and stories, object lessons, things like that. So when you're talking to Muslims, try to think of examples from your own life or stories or object lessons around you for Trinity and things like that. And maybe we can talk about those later. But I'm very thankful that you have joined us today. I hope that we've given you some practical ideas or just ways to start thinking about how you will talk to Muslims when you need to defend the faith and to share it with others. Thanks so much. Amen. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to our moderators. Uh, we had the privilege of having uh, Dr. Cynthia with us uh, from www.christianfrommuslim.com. Uh, Christian Christian from and we encourage you, of course, to check out that website. Um, Dr. Cynthia, do you have you in a YouTube channel? Or if they go there, yes. they'll be able to access all of that. It's the same name. You Great. can subscribe to us on YouTube. An easy way to do that is if you play one of our videos from the website, you can push YouTube, which means you watch that video on YouTube, and then it will give you the subscribe button. It is harder to find it if you're searching it, but it's the same name, Christian from Muslim. Wonderful. Dr. Cynthia is going to be one of the teachers or speakers at uh, the our Strong Tower uh, mm -hmm. that will be uh, basically hosted in California and online also which uh, I hosted uh, Pastor George Sayeg the other day to promote it. And I am, uh, you know, pray for us. I'm asking uh, her to uh, see if her schedule permits her also to do something uh, for our conference, uh, which is in the middle of October. You can also go to my uh, basically Facebook page and or our website, uh, www.sirainternational.com. In there, we have a section under learn uh, about our conference that will be hosted on October 14th, 15th, and 16th online. We have the likes of Dr. Jay Smith, Sam Shamoon, uh, Dr. Tony Costa, and many others. And we're hoping that we can at least record some, uh, maybe a lesson or two by Dr. Cynthia. And we pray that next year she will be one of our speakers as well. But all that to say is uh, there is a lot that is available out there for all of you. And we hope that you can benefit from all of these tools and trainings. Uh, tonight, I will be doing a brief promo with Dr. J. Smith about our conference. And I will start, you know, basically, uh, I'll kick off a series of these promos, including myself uh, talking about it. And then I'll have Brother Nasser from Saudi. I'm going to have Dr. Tony Costa. I'm going to have a couple of brothers also uh, who will teach on the prophecy side of things. Uh, but I will share more details about that conference when we do this. Thank you again, Dr. Cynthia. We appreciate your time. Thanks. And thank you, everyone. This is Al-Fadi over and out. God bless you guys.